I'm super excited to have uh, everyone uh, here today. We've got uh, just an amazing uh, webinar guest panelist here for us. And not only do we have, um, normally we have one person answering some amazing questions and sharing their wisdom. We're doing it with four um, people here today, and I'm super excited to intro them. I am also joined here by uh, my co-host, uh, Kate, over at Leap. Kate, thank you so much for joining uh, me today. Can you first tell, tell us a little bit about Leap? Tell us a little about you. Totally. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm so happy to be joining you guys uh, from Leap headquarters. Leap is a an awesome iOS app for contractors um, to really make sure that they're driving those sales appointments uh, to the best optimization by creating great documents. Uh, we have some amazing integrations with your CRMs, your measurement providers. Um, you know, it's a really robust tool. And it's one of those things that if you don't know about it, you're already behind. You should definitely be taking it a look. Uh, and I think these guys all here can attest to it. I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody's got to say. Um, I'm the marketing manager over here at Leap. I'm so excited to be joined by some great friends in the industry as well. Awesome. And I, I'm Sean Connors with Contractor Appointments. We do performance marketing lead generation um, on a performance per lead per appointment or on a per sale revenue share basis. So um, and we do these webinars Try to get them out every single week, and, uh, and we'll continue to do that here moving forward. So, um, so yeah, I uh, want to make a special shout out here because we had uh, not this is like our first like big event here, um, and we we invited some sponsors to go share this information out there. I wanted to mention them um, and call them out here. So, Market Sharp, Patch, Hearth, Engage, Destination Motivation, Signpost, G Four. Think Unlimited and Eagle View all were a part of our sponsorship of this um, event and kind of just driving uh, people to this and getting the word out about this. So I, I just wanted to, uh, to make a special shout out to them. Um, afterwards, too, you'll see that the, all the companies who sponsored feel free. I highly encourage you to go reach out to the, these sponsors. And the reason why we chose these companies as sponsors is because we all kind of work with them. So um, in different capacities, and we highly recommend them. We all share a very similar audience base, and there's a reason for that. So companies who are doing really good work are using these companies to better their businesses. So um, if you're in growth mode, if you're at scale, um, and you're wanting to scale, these are great companies and uh, to reach out to to be, help you do that in every capacity. So uh, with all that to be said, um, let's get to the webinar. Let's get to the, the, the meat of this thing. So um, the, the title of the webinar today is just marketing at scale. So maintaining your marketing cost at scale. So I'm going to provide a little context and then we'll dive into just panel questions right away. So um, first off, COVID obviously spiked the industry as a whole here. Many of our companies grew exponentially. Um, so today we're just going to focus on how do you maintain your marketing cost as we're still trying to grow our organizations kind of in a post COVID spike of a world here. So how do we make sure that lead volume stays high? How do we make sure marketing costs stay at a sustainable rate for us to grow and grow significantly? Um, and just wanting to acknowledge and slow down here and acknowledge that the, that there is a natural slowdown here that we naturally see in July and August as we'll kind of talk about here from a lead volume standpoint. And uh, just the nature of this post-COVID world we live in, there's fear of recession, all of those things, interest rates potentially climbing, and how do we deal with those? So that's what we're going to talk about today. So, uh, But at the end of the day, we believe now is the better time to be able to still scale your business and double down on what you're doing for marketing. And, uh, and that's why I invited these panelists here today to share their wisdom with us. Um, and, and help you kind of scale and maintain your marketing um, as we go through this next season and what this next looks like for the next year and, and so forth. So with all that to do, Kate, do you mind uh, introing our, our panelists here today? Totally, totally. Uh, I am so excited to have uh, these four gentlemen with us today to really just expose all that we're talking about with marketing. So I want to go ahead and start. I've, I'm not even going to lie to you guys. I'm going to read uh, for each one of these guys. First, we've got Chris Williamson. He is a coach at Tony Honey Training and Consulting. He is an experienced marketing manager with a demonstrated history of working in the construction industry. He is skilled in negotiation, canvassing, sales, sales management, real estate, and team building. 
And fun fact, he is uh, our comedian here today. He is the uh, was a professional com uh, comedian stand up for over twenty years. So welcome, Chris. Um, next, we've got Pete DeBalt, VP of Sales and Marketing at G Four Marketing Group. He develops and implements profit-focused marketing and business development strategies designed to get residential contractors more uh, customers at the lowest marketing cost. So welcome, Pete. Thanks, Kate. Awesome. Next, we've got Doug Schatz, VP of Development at Socius. He has spent more than 13 years achieving exponential increases in network reach and engagement for nationally renowned digital marketing and technology serving technology firms serving thousands of businesses in the U.S. and Canada. He has exceptional understanding of partner cultivation, engagement, and serving subject matter expert serving as a subject matter expert at a hundred of conferences and events reaching thousands of attendees apologies i really butchered that one thanks but last, <laughs> hi. last but oh certainly not least we've got nathan tivado lead coach at contractor coach pro 20 plus years in the home services industry he writes and builds content speaks and is host of the contractor radio podcast at contractor coach pro and is a trusted coach and advisor to some of the best contractors and leaders in the industry Welcome, Nathan. Thank you so much, Kate. Yeah. Well, I, as I said, I'm really excited. But Nathan, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. You know, I, I have to start with you, right? <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if you have to. But... You. I always do. Uh, can you give us a pulse on the industry as a whole right now? Yeah. Um, so in as far as we deal with uh, a lot of different contractors in different uh, sectors of the industry um, and from a coaching perspective, we get a chance to kind of hear what their struggles are uh, from the backside of things rather than what they just put out into the world. Um, and some of the interesting things that we saw over the COVID era, and this this probably holds true with almost any kind of um, large situation that happens across an industry or across a nation, or in this case, across the world, you generally see two kinds of people when it comes to business. You see the people who who decide that they need to play it safe, they need to hunker down, and they need to weather the storm. Um, and I know that that definitely works in some cases and for some people. Uh, the second group of people are the ones who see massive levels of opportunity because they know that others are going to hunker down. And so you got these two different types of folks. And I know that definitely over over the COVID situation, that only became that dichotomy was only more apparent. Some people started to really ramp up their marketing. Some people started getting really creative with their outreach. Some people started to uh, really dive deeper into technology and begin to utilize those resources resources to continue to work with customers because despite the fact that COVID's happening, weather still happens too. And people have things on their home that break and they've got leaks coming in on their roof and they've got pieces of siding hanging off and windows. That you... So contractors, a lot of these contractors got super creative uh, in how they're going to deal with some of those things. Now, as far as the way the industry is currently going and some of the fallout from that, uh, that we're starting to see is uh, we're seeing uh, people not necessarily knowing exactly what to do with their money, right? So people's vacations started to take a little bit of dive, but then all of a sudden, like uh, the toys, the market for toys went up, ATVs, motorcycles, uh, RV units, campgrounds, all of a sudden became really full. The other thing that happened is that people were not necessarily in this buying and selling of their home phase. That kind of slowed down a little bit and they started focusing more on the home they had. And so, uh, as Sean mentioned earlier, with interest rates starting to go up, as we see evidences of a recession, and remember, some of this stuff is mental, so we got to be careful about uh, uh, initiating our own future, right? So we do have some evidences that a recession may be on its way. We want to be careful about being too doomsday about that kind of stuff mentally. But one of the things that you do see in these situations is people start to focus on where they're at now. And so... Maybe we don't buy. I got a friend I talked to just the other day. He said he put upgrading his home on the shelf and he said, I'm just going to be happy with what I have now, which means he's going to be looking at adding a fire pit, building his deck. Maybe he's going to add a different section to his home. He's going to be doing different things, which means there's opportunity for contractors to help them with that. 
Um, many different versions of, of financing are available for folks. Uh, we're seeing supply chain issues are starting to become a problem. Who has material? Where is that material? How long is it going to take to get that material? And furthermore, what's that material going to cost when it comes time to put it in your hand? OK, and so one of the major things we're seeing is, is that your relationships as a contractor with your suppliers and with your uh, uh, with your manufacturers is becoming even more and more key. And so the better your relationship with them, we're seeing contractors who worked so diligently on those things, starting to see a little bit of benefit from having that relationship play out when it comes to supply chain. And then when it comes to having a consistency of work and a consistency of leads, those people who have either stuck to their marketing plan through belief and those people who've added and increased their marketing creativity and outreach are finding those people who are looking for, for different ways to improve uh, their lifestyle and, and, and their homes uh, through different mediums. So somebody's scrolling through a social media piece and they see a contractor that says something like, hey, plan on staying in your home for a little while. Let us help it make an even make it an even more beautiful place. Bam. All of a sudden, oh, well, you know what? We thought about doing this addition. Now we're not going to move. Why don't we think about that? And so contractor creativity uh, as well as belief are two major things helping to uh, impact how you attack what you're dealing with in the market right now. No, that's, that's amazing, Nathan. I appreciate you kind of sharing that and, and giving us a pulse. I think just like you said, I think the, we, we have all these looming potential of recession and we have all these things that are potentials that are out there and, um, and that we see, and that we have to make sure we're not adjusting to uh, making too many radical adjustments for something that we don't necessarily know is completely coming here too. Mm -hmm. So I think that is something to make sure of is sticking with your marketing plan is what I heard you saying and that side of things and making sure that you're consistently as you should be always doing with your marketing is trying to stay relevant, trying to stay creative in what you're doing and trying to get out there. So as we, as we can transition here, I want to ask um, each one of you some of these questions. And I think on that creativity note, um, here, I wanted to give you each three minutes to answer this question is just going, what are the top channels? And we can even put that creativity in there as well. What are the top channels that everyone yeah. should be using for their marketing in, uh, right now and why? So Chris, I want to start with you. What are the, what are the three channels that you know are consistent that people should be doing? Can it create some consistency there and why? Well, thanks for having me on the podcast, uh, the webcast uh, webinar, and thank you to all the sponsors out there. Much appreciated. Those of you who know Tony Hody know it's a canvas events retail. That that's always been Tony's bread and butter, and it was mine too. So the first thing I want to talk about is is canvassing because a lot of companies got away from it, uh, especially due to due to COVID. You know, um, it's. If you have good canvassers and you have a good canvas team, they're going to generate leads on a daily basis. And, and it's more predictable than you would think, you know, and and I go through formulas with people where like, let's say you have the the big canvas van. Right. And it's got 10 seats and you can kind of go through and say, well, we have 10 seats and everybody's got to get two leads a day. That's 20 leads a day. Um, maybe 10 of them are going to run right away. Maybe 10 of them are going to get rescheduled and kind of bounce around, but we could kind of go through a formula where something like canvas is a predictable lead source in, in any kind of a, a market, you know, um, another reason companies have been told got away from canvas. Uh, there were a few reasons. One was they didn't really need to deal with it because they were so busy, right? It's been so busy. The, the last few years, but as, as things start to happen, I, I think number one, Canvas is, companies should take a good hard look at that as far as generating leads. Uh, the, the people that are afraid of Canvas have heard the horror stories about how marketing costs can, can run wild. And typically, you know, a lot of Canvas departments where we're putting young people with no management experience in charge of other young people running Canvas departments and you know, so there are ways to avoid the, the pitfalls, right, of, of a canvas department. But, but I can tell you right now, there's canvas departments around the country that are, that are doing great. They're doing, they're doing fantastic, you know. Um, but some companies aren't ready for that. They don't want the big van. They don't want the 10 canvassers. A program that we came up with was a, a second avenue would be a brand ambassador. Someone in your company that's 
actually going to go out and, and maybe meet with a homeowner while installation is going on. Someone that's going to go into the house um, after installation is done, take before and after pictures to put on social media, uh, ensure good social media scores and, and feedback on the internet. Um, but why that person also becomes important that brand, aside from the social media scores and good customer service and, and things like that, that, they're also going to they're going to do some canvassing around the installation, just the immediate neighbors. But they're also going to meet with the homeowner and hopefully generate um, referral leads, uh, possibly even get maybe they did five windows and the brand ambassador is able to get five more windows. Or maybe they had a roofing job done, but they have an old bathroom and maybe it's a window and bath company, that kind of thing. So maybe they get the owner just got windows. Now they, they get them into a walk in maybe getting a price on a walk-in tub or something like that. But um, we're working with some brand ambassadors around the country now that are, that are generating both goodwill and uh, leads. You know, it's another, it's another, and again, it can be kind of predictable. Like this person is going to get this many leads, this many days a week. And, and it, you know, it, it helps you, um, you know, stay consistent. And it's one of those things too. I always found canvas and brand ambassador when everyone says, oh, you know, how are you going to stay busy in December? Well, those are the type of people that will keep your houses when things are slow. You know, um, those are the people that might go out on a Friday afternoon and fill the Saturday morning fall off that might happen on the on the calendar or the schedule. But but they need training and they, and they need they need management in order to keep the cost uh, so that it doesn't become prohibited. And, and, and the last one I, I, I kind of mentioned, right, uh, good social media scores and, and repeat business and referral business. That's. That's always a great way to generate leads. Um, so those would be those would be my ideas. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I think Chris, uh, like that's that was my background. I started off canvassing, and if you can't get more predictable than sending someone out for four hours, they don't come back with leads. That uh, you you can choose the neighborhoods you go into, and if you know which markets, the neighborhoods that have money and are more likely to buy your product, you have more control than you do with other means of advertising, right? I think that's a that's a huge portion of things as well. Yes. Um, uh, one thing you touched on there was just the referral side of things. So, Pete, I want to hand that over to you with uh, that being the last thing I said. Of, I want to hear from you just what what are three things, um, channels that you believe companies should do and why? Yeah, well, thanks, Chris, for, you know, uh, I guess, firming up my my three things. Well, referrals, repeat business, reviews, and I'll throw in a fourth. I would say rehash, you know, staying in front of those unsold leads. So as we all know, over the last two years or, you know, since the beginning of 2020, uh, leads opportunity has just been abundant. We've been running more appointments. We've been selling more jobs. And so we've been, in theory, putting all of these quote unquote relationships on the books, but are we actually building relationships or are we treating them like transactions and focusing on the new opportunity only, right? The new leads that are coming in because we were just so busy. So it's, it's really important now more than ever to take a look back. And if you haven't already start to build a, a foundation a, uh, of relationships so that you can build referral business, not only for today, but for years to follow, right? Or, and or depending on your product mix and your service, you know, repeat business, right? I mean, I know it's difficult to sell a roof. You don't want to sell a roof over and over again, but if you're doing roof repair, you certainly want to stay in front of that homeowner so that you get that opportunity down the road for the full replacement. You know, if you're selling baths, windows, you know, doors, whatever it is, that is your relationship. You want to make sure you're putting a fence around it and staying in touch and making sure that, your customers are aware of all of these great services that you're a, that you provide, that you're a reputable company, that you appreciate referrals, that you actually reward for referrals. And then I mentioned rehash. So again, a lot of these leads that we, we generated didn't buy for whatever reason. It doesn't mean that they won't buy at some point. So, you know, we've already invested in that lead. Most of us have some sort of database or CRM where we are you know, housing these names, these contacts. So we need to be recycling through and making sure that we are 
you know, giving those unsold leads the appropriate attention so that we can get them back into the funnel. And, and really all of this, all of those sources are going to be some of your most profitable lead sources. Um, and really the ones that you can count on as, you know, we talk about the recession and potential downturn, you know, again, it's not doom and gloom, but when things potentially do take a turn like that, you know, it's the companies that can actually rely on their relationships that will get through those versus the ones that, you know, just kind of moved on to the next and kept moving on and didn't stay in touch. So I would say those three plus the additional bonus and rehash would be, you know, four great opportunities right now today. Yeah. I think that's, that's amazing. I think one of the things about re, you know, just as you kind of brought up here too, and I love about G4 is you guys are talking about like the customer life value. And I think so many times replacement contracting, when it comes to roofing, the best time to add an additional trade or service to your company is in a recession. When you can go back to your pre previous customers who said yes to you once and now from a different product. Um, so, and make sure you get more yeses out of the same people who already said yes to you and already have loyalty to you and already said once. Yes, once. So with that being said, Doug, I would love for you to answer that question here too. The three main uh, ways to be able to generate channels to generate uh, business and why. Yeah. And thanks again for having me on today, Sean and Kate. Really excited to be here. So uh, Socius is a digital marketing agency and we do everything from you know building websites to SEO to, to Google ad programs. But when it comes to creating scale in the economy that we're in right now, I think the most important thing that you need to go into that with is a plan that is truly tracking the different marketing efforts that you have, ways that you can really prove the ROI of what you're doing, as opposed to just trying five or six different strategies, sticking your thumb in the air and saying, business is up, but you're not really able to attribute it to anything specifically. We've all worked with companies like that before. Social media is a really good place to start. So, you know, one of the benefits of social is it's a lot more cost effective to advertise on Facebook and Instagram than it is on Google, traditional Google ads these days. And a lot of our clients are booked out six, eight months, something like that. And so Google ads for somebody like that, when you're paying for that click, paying for that lead, that's probably, you know, for some of you, if you're booked out that far, that might not be the best strategy right now. That's where social comes into play. And I think um, A-B testing strategies on Facebook and Instagram, where you're attaching an offer associated with it is really smart because if, if there's no offer connected to what you're doing and that offer could be anything you want. Otherwise, it just becomes awareness marketing. And while we've run campaigns like that before, you, um, you have a hard time attributing actual revenue to the advertising that you're doing in that space. And so when we're entering uncertain economic times, and I agree with what everybody said before, um, we don't want to become a self-fulfilling prophecy about what the economy is going to do. We need to be smart here, but social is a great place to start. Another place where our team does phenomenal work is, is traditional SEO, search engine optimization. And this is actually a really critical strategy now because while SEO is something that takes time to achieve results and requires some patience, when you're busy is exactly the time that you should be focusing on SEO um, because it helps set you up for three, six, 12 months down the road. And what we have seen at Socius is the highest quality leads that you can get from customers that are in consideration mode traditionally come from those that are making buying decisions in the organic results, right? Um, so something for everybody to consider, it takes a little patience. Uh, you've probably been burned out there before. That doesn't mean it should turn you off from the value of high quality leads that come from that. And then the last thing I would add is it's a really smart time to start considering um, video as a part of your strategy. And I think a lot of people shy away from this because they feel like they're overwhelmed by this concept. We're not telling you to go out there and create $15,000 commercials, be creative, be scrappy, be authentic in this space. And when you do that with videos, you really connect with your audiences more effectively. It's more likely to create referral opportunities for you. Um, but that's something that we see as really the future of a lot more marketing because a lot of customers that our clients are targeting, it takes time for them to go through that buying cycle. You need to stay in front of them via social, 
via video as they're considering you against your competition. I love that, Doug. And I think the the video being so huge today, I think that there's so many limiting factors there of just not feeling like you're awkward or even as we're on a video right now, it's like, this is weird. This is awkward. You just have to do it more and more to get comfortable with it. And, uh, but at the end of the end of the day, like the one other piece that I pulled out of there too, is that you need a unique offer um, in a very busy marketplace that, that goes back to that creativity and an offer can be different than promotion. So I think separating those two of like, this is our weekly or monthly promotion. Here's your offer. What, what separates you from the competition in your market? And that's what Again, whether you're canvassing or whether you're doing anything in the in the marketing realm, the more unique your offer is, um, you can find more of the your customer out there too. So, Nathan, I want to turn it over to you and hear your your response to that. Oh, boy, how do I get to go last after this one? All right, let me think here. What has <laughs> somebody not talked about? You guys are all that's all great. I I agree with each one of those things, and 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 one of the things that I'm seeing kind of break out of this a little bit is this concept. And and Chris kind of kicked that whole thing off. Is there is a component of direct marketing, right? You have passive marketing where it's top of mind, and you want like Doug was talking a little bit about that too, where you want people to think of your company when they think of a need for the service you offer, uh, and then then you have that direct marketing component where you go out and find those people. And so don't forget about that. I think oftentimes people just simply assume direct marketing to be door knocking or putting out flyers or cold calling folks. But that direct marketing could be just just at a gas station putting, you know, $80 a gallon gas into your into your tank. Um, so it, where you are in realizing that that sometimes people don't know they have a need. And so the more you're out and, and being available and, and, and letting people know what you do and educating those around you, whether it be door knocking or flyers or phone calls or even just going to your kid's soccer game, that could be a form of direct marketing. And so getting out there to the people, because honestly, there isn't just like we say this a contractor, because there's no such thing as, as a contractor's mall. If you want to go pie, try a pair of jeans on, you can go to the mall and try on a hundred different pairs of jeans in, in two hours, but there's no place to go to, to find out what things you might need for your home. So keep, keep that component in mind. Um, the social media for sure. Social media is funny because it's kind of, it's a both and social media is almost a direct marketing while at the same time, it's also passive because there isn't just a human being standing in front of you at your door or wherever you might be. And so understanding that, 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 how how that thing works and that you are reaching out and that you can be specific about who you're reaching out to through social media and making sure that you're reaching out to the right people. Um, if you do a lot of in-home work, you probably want to try to figure out how to not end up sending a lot of information to people who live in apartments. So that's, that'd be an important thing to keep in mind. Associates is great at helping you out with some of those strategies. The last one, the last one that occurred to me uh, is the concept of community outreach, being in places where people go. Now, uh, I don't have a child yet, but uh, those who I know that have kids find themselves creating, being a part of a community just because their kid and a bunch of other parents all have their kids on the same team at the same school or in the same club. And so can you do things as a company to support what's going on in the community and continue to put yourself out there? So if, if you're a company and you you sponsor the kids' jerseys for, for the local soccer team, imagine how that looks. Your parent, the parents of those teams are like, hey, this company came along and, and, and sponsored these jerseys. That's fantastic. Who are these guys again? Where did they come from? And then maybe you get a a banner at the at the field or at the stadium or something like that. And people recognize that you're a part of that community and that you're not that far away. You're not some big conglomerate of some kind that's that's just out there in the ether. But that the guy that put that banner on that on that thing over oh, there's probably in this crowd somewhere. Or hey, that's the guy talking to me right now. Okay. And so that that component of direct marketing is helpful. Uh, I also think that social media component, which is kind of a hybrid of those two, and then being sure that you're in the community and that you're visible to those around you. Um, hashtag two cents. That's, that's awesome. I think that and I think I love the community aspect of things and I don't see it enough. 
And really, you know, like if your kids are in, uh, you know, in sports, well, why not sponsor that sporting event? And you're already in the community, you're in the crowd. Why not be able to do some of that stuff? That stuff is pretty cheap marketing overall, too. You get uh, in the local flyers and all that kind of stuff and local events and sponsorships. They're they're pretty inexpensive. I think that ties in with what Chris was mentioning. And what you didn't touch on, Chris, was the events side of things. The, that business kind of starting to you know become a bigger portion of things again here as well, which is, is huge to be a part of. And not only the home improvement events, but all of the events that are out there in your community and involved and in being present in front of those prospective customers. So like anything from the digital, what, what, uh, you know, from the digital side of things and meeting customers from an awareness and that side to getting in the, in front of the right customer, um, via just going to the right homes and knocking on the right doors and the events that are there and being involved in the community. And I think Pete, as, as you're mentioning here, just making sure you're really taking care of the customers who already said yes to you in the past. And, and staying present with them, if they said yes to an appointment with you in the past, or they filled out a form on your website, or they were at a show lead or whatever that was in the past, how do you stay present in front of them and keep your brand in front of them? I think it's huge. So next question here, I want to turn it over to Kate. Kate, you can run with this one here too. Absolutely. And I, I really do love what everybody said. It's interesting. You have to kind of get out and get into an uncomfortable zone. Uh, and then it with maybe video or social media or SEO, but then don't forget what got us here. Right. I mean, I literally had to stop wearing leap shirts in the airport, traveling to all the events because of the amount of people that asked me questions. And then I ended up showing them and what I really wanted was just a drink before the flight. So, uh, so, you know, definitely all really great points. Um, and again, we're, we're talking about that recession, you know, relationships is everything. Uh, it'll get you further than you can imagine. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, some things that companies that uh, have scaled or um, that are scaling do or are doing, that's a, a lot of question there, uh, that you believe other companies can adopt. So what are people doing, companies doing that are scaling and, and what can we adopt from that? So I want to go ahead and I want to start with Doug. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Kate. I, um, as a marketing agency, we, we focus on driving leads for our customers first and foremost, and you can't scale if you don't have leads naturally. I, I think we all know that's the case. But what we have seen for our clients who have truly been able to achieve scale, going from uh, you know seven figures to eight figures to ultimately nine figures a year, there, there are two critical components to that. Um, it starts with your people. Uh, and there is no component of uh, conversations we've had with our clients that's been a bigger pain point over the past few years than hiring and retaining talent, but successful companies are finding smart ways to do that. And I think that the uh, way that you hire, the way that you retain, the way that you keep your employees engaged is more important now than it ever has been before. We know that there's a demand for uh, new employees out there. We know there's a lot of people looking for work, but it's a good time to be creative, to be bold with the strategies that you have when you're hiring to make sure that you bring in the right people and that you retain them. The second component is technology um, and using tools like Leap and a lot of the great partners who are sponsoring today's webinar. Um, having a CRM is a must. Leveraging that CRM with add-on solutions. If you don't have those things in place, um, you know, I'm going back to thinking of the contractor who's taking his thumb, sticking it in the air and saying, I had a good month, right? But I don't really know where that came from. So I think people in technology, once you have the leads flowing in, that's when you create scale and that's when you're really operating and, and humming like um, an operation that you should be. Totally. I, I can obviously I work at Leap, right? I cannot agree more with that that technology aspect. I mean, even the sponsors of the today's webinar, the CRM, we have Market Sharp sponsoring. Like everyone, take a look at this technology. It's Again, one of those things, if you don't know what, what we're talking about, you're already behind. So get on top of that. Um, I want to kind of pivot a little bit over, uh, I believe, Pete, you are next. Uh, can you let me know what you think two things that a uh, company should be doing um, to help scale? Yeah, so um, I've been going second. It's great. And, and it's also kind of uh, difficult because, uh, Doug, I wish 
we all would have compared our answers. Uh, the people aspect of this is so uh, important. And as you, as you see, so many of these companies are trying to shift their focus to, you know, um, development, right? Training and development, you know, making sure that they are maximizing their employees' potential. Uh, you know, years ago, when I first started in the home improvement comp, uh, industry, you know, uh, you would hear at all these conferences, you know, we don't sell windows, we aren't a home improvement company, we're a sales and marketing company, right? And now you see some of these companies that are scaling, that are getting acquired out there, um, they've, they've taken it the next step and they've taken it to that personal development, to that, you know, achieving the most um, and giving their employees that ownership feel or, or more than, you know, maybe what this industry had done in the past, which uh, was, you know, giving them more opportunity to grow within the company to keep them and retain them. Um, and the culture is a big part of that, uh, you know, obviously uh, not just the, the training, but then just all of that that goes into the the day to day, um, you know, lifestyle there and how the different oper or the different departments communicate with each other. Uh, so I think the people aspect is uh, has been a very challenging aspect. Actually, I was just at an event here in the beginning of June where um, they said one of our, our biggest threats uh, in our industry is the aging workforce. You know, so I don't know if this is really going to um, go away by any means. Uh, you know, a lot of um, the challenges that we're experiencing today are probably going to continue for the foreseeable future as we just aren't promoting the services um, as much as we should, the trades, uh, you know, the opportunities there. So, you know, capitalizing on the team and finding that talent and making them feel like uh, this, they have a, a real stake is, is very important. And then I guess the other big part of, um, you know, what I'm seeing a lot of these successful companies really kick ass is their customer experience. Um, you know, a lot of that doesn't show up, I guess, maybe on a, uh, on a balance sheet, right? I mean, you're, you you can see certainly reviews and that is going to tell a story to your prospect or to, you know, potentially even a, um, a new hire candidate, right? They want to work at the, at a place that takes care of their customers, but then even more it's, it's, um, you know, providing that, like you said, that awareness, that that foothold, that word of mouth opportunity in the local marketplace, because people are now talking about the experience. They are sharing their story about how the rep showed up and how they were different, or maybe the fact that they appreciated um, and said thank you, right? They, they showed up and, and did something a little different than what, what no one really does very well uh, with anymore today. So I think the customer experience, and one of the things to, that's key is with customer experience, it's not just on the front end, it's something that you continue all the way through the completion of the project and then all the way forever, right? I mean, you wanna to continue to build that relationship uh, similar to like how some of the very successful brands like Disney and you know a lot of these airlines create these, um, uh, not just airlines, you know, credit card companies, banks, you know, all of these different rewards companies, uh, I'm sorry, rewards opportunities. So customer experience and people have um, stood out to me on, on many of the calls. And just from what I see, when you see these teams walking proudly through these events, they've got their logos on, they're all looking and, and playing the same part. It seems like everybody's on the same page with the company mission. Um you know, those are the ones that are going to continue to win. And I think, um, you know, hopefully set the table for the next, the next round of contractors that come in behind this. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I, I actually spoke at a top rep contractor coach pros event. I know I think you got the shirt on, uh, but I talked about uh, the millennial homeowner and how you are speaking to them. Do you really know who your customers are and your workforce is because in the end that's the people that are going to get you ahead you know really making sure that you are investing in the time and the resources there to know who you're talking to so really thank you pete all right next up chris can you let me know what you think we should be doing yeah i'm, I'm kind of going down a similar road but with a non-traditional marketing twist but um 
we always talk about customer experience, which right on is right on the money. At the same time, it's employee experience too, right? Great employees are going to get us more leads. And one of the things I learned, like as a canvas manager for many years, um, you can have a van that holds 10 canvassers. If 10 canvassers get 10 leads a night, it's not as good as five canvassers getting 10 leads a night, right? Because if five canvassers are getting you the same amount of leads, it's costing you half the money with five canvassers as opposed to 10. Um, what if five canvassers give 15 or 20? You know, so, but it comes down to having a, a motivated, awesome staff and it, it comes down to culture and it really starts from the time you interview somebody, what's their experience when they walk in your door? Are they greeted warmly or are they stuck in the kitchen because you don't know where they're going to be interviewed? You know, like, I, you know, I, I've kind of done both. Um, but tying into that employee experience is, is training. You know, are you, are you riding along with your sales reps? Are you you're a canvas manager? Are, are you out in the van with the team? Or are you sitting in your office? Uh, are you knocking doors? It, if you're an events rep, are you are you actually at the events uh, talking to people and helping your team? One of the things I learned was um, new reps quite often start off like a like a house of fire, but then after two or three weeks, they hit a couple of speed bumps. You know, like maybe I'm a I'm, I'm a rep, an event rep that wrote some leads, but they didn't demo for whatever reason. You know, are we training these people? Are we grooming these people? And then are we asking them? to kind of bring in their friends. Like, do, are, are they aware of the, you know, is there an employee referral bonus if they bring someone great into the company? You know, think I've worked for companies that had a thousand dollar employee referral bonus and people didn't know about it, you know? Um, so the first thing is the people, 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 great people are going to, are going to bring you great results. But, it, but again, it's, it's culture. And um, to me, it's leading in the field, whether you're whatever type manager you are, sales, canvas events. My second thing would be going back to the brand ambassador. And I know, um, you know, Doug had mentioned videos and Nathan was talking about like the community outreach and stuff. I, I think that's huge. A, a great brand ambassador is, is going to help you get, you only need a department of one as opposed to a huge canvas department, but, but a brand ambassador might get you a few leads a day a few good reviews, um, but they're, they're also doing things like joining community pages. Um, you know, like if you live in Rocky River, Ohio, maybe you're posting to the Rocky River, Ohio moms group that we're going to be at a certain event that weekend. Um, we've done things where we put, we put contests on like, Hey, our canvas team is going to be in such and such a town. The first person that sends us a picture gets a $50 gift card. And, you know, so you start to get, mentioned you know people say hey i need windows we'll call this company you know because they've seen us in these in these groups uh videos I, I, we, we have a good relationship with um flex screen and if you saw some of flex screens early videos it was it was pretty much with the cell phone and they were beating the hell out of flex screens and posting those videos and stuff that that's the type of stuff a good brand, brand ambassador can, can do for you is kind of get you noticed and get leads that don't have a, a, it's not a huge amount of money to generate those, you know, that, that's where I would go. Totally, totally. You know, it's something that I think we're all touching on here. And, it, you know, maybe we're not saying it explicitly enough. We all just went through a pandemic and we didn't get to see a lot of people and it became very almost dehumanizing being away from everyone. Don't forget the value of people. It's, it's what is the core of our society any society. So really making sure that you are connecting, you know, with your customers, with your employees and making sure that they feel valued, just like you would want to feel valued yourself. The other thing I, I heard you say was about the brand ambassadors. I hate to admit it guys, but roofing TikTok has over 600,000 uh, followers. So, you know, there's, there's some awkward plays there, but you could go for TikTok. I'm not going to, but I'm just saying, <laughs> All right. Last, but again, not least, Nathan, bring it home. <laughs> <laughs> so man, um, things companies do to scale. This could be a, this could be a webinar all on its own. And so maybe we jot that down um, because I was thinking about this. I was yeah. like, oh my gosh. So uh, I'm going to hit on one thing very quickly because I'd like to spend the rest of my, my moments talking about something hyper practical. The one thing I would hit on is if you're really interested in, in this concept of scaling, which has become a bit of a buzzword, number one, 
first figure out whether or not your company's in a position to do it anyway. Okay. If you're a chuck in a truck or a Jan in a van or you're a solo operator or whatever, the concept of scaling shouldn't be in your brain right now. You're just, that's your business is not in that position, number one. So breathe easy when you hear everybody talk about having to scale. You're not there yet. And that's okay. You should be concerned about where you're going to be in 18 months. Okay. Not about how you're going to hire 100 people in the next two years. So breathe easy. Number two, or second thing on that one is process. The more detailed your process is and your customer journey throughout your company, I mean detailed, like literally this phase of your process is the appointment. You show up at this time, you put your ladder right in this place, you that, 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 that right now. And the more detailed that process is, then as you increase the volume and the velocity of your business, it's easier for you to begin to break down those roles that exist in your company and assign to them what they specifically do. Because scaling isn't just adding people to your business. Scaling is actually refining and narrowing the scope of what each one of those people do due to the volume increase that you're doing. Okay. Like I said, we should consider doing a webinar on that all by itself, but I'll set that on a shelf. Here's what the thing I really want to talk about since we are talking marketing, the concept of scaling your marketing leads. Okay. That's a, that's a thing that I think uh, sometimes we forget about. <clears throat> we talk about referrals. We talk about uh, uh, reaching out to the neighbors. We talk about these things. Two things that go into this. Number one, value. Absolutely, 100%. You have got to bring the value and you got to be a rock star at bringing value. And you have to bring that value for every single lead and every single prospect you deal with. And here's the reason why you're not going to do business with every single person you talk to. You may roll up to the home because they were concerned that they had a problem. You took a look at it. Turns out there isn't necessarily one, or maybe there is. Okay. So, how many additional leads can you generate? per individual lead that you get. That's how we scale our leads. So for every single lead I run, can I turn that lead into two or more referrals? And for every single home I enter, can I convert two or three or four of the neighbors around them into a lead and convert those leads into a prospect or a customer and then gain another two or three referrals from them? So now the house, the house, the company just sent me one lead. I've got the potential to generate as many as 20 additional leads off of that one lead. You do that through value. So I'll give you a quick example of this. If you've ever taken your vehicle into the shop and you're like, hey, John, I got a little thing going on with my truck here. Not sure what's up. And John says, calls you back, says, hey, Nathan, I took a look. It really wasn't a thing. We kind of took care of it, topped off your fluids. You're, you can come pick up your truck. And I go, great, John, how much do I owe you? And he goes, nothing. How do you feel? You feel amazing. You're like, I expected to spend 500 bucks because every time I get my vehicle near the, near the shop, I got to spend $500. And now I'm being told I don't have to do anything. If you encounter a homeowner and that's a situation with them, that's exactly how they feel too. Totally. So if I provide value and evidence, how unreasonable is it for me to ask them for a review? Now you've got somebody reviewing your company and saying, hey, you want an honest appraisal of your home with somebody who isn't just going to tell you they have to, you have to buy services? This guy came out, spent an hour and a half at my home, gave me a full inspection, report, and documentation, and turns out I didn't need any work. You should call these guys. Furthermore, even if I don't do any work for this person, do you think they know somebody else who could use a nice, honest evaluation of their home? No transaction occurred. And I now have a five-star review on Google and Facebook. And I probably have maybe one or two or three leads. So do, can we can we take that avenue and then ask our guys if they can create, do a competition? Mm -hmm. Hey, you guys, can you create a spider web of leads from each lead we give you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I actually, I really love that, that whole concept. And, you know, you kind of touched on reviews. It's something that we haven't really talked about much today, but uh, you know, I, I come from actually a partner marketing standpoint and partner marketing actually started because people started doing their own research and not listening to ads as much. They wanted to know from a trusted source what the reality is. So if you can do a campaign that is going to get you reviews, do it because you can get your name out there. Great. We, we sponsored the baseball team. Then they're going to look you up. 
And if you have bad reviews or no reviews, then then you're just as good as just, you know, not even putting your logo up there. Totally. All right. Well, I thank you guys for answering that question. And I'm going to hand it back to Sean. Well, can I take a minute? Like these answers are amazing. Like this, like one thing that like, you guys all touching on is just the power of people like at scale period, when it comes to the systems, and the process, and no matter what they're doing, you cannot scale a business in the home improvement industry without people on your team that are quality. And, and I think the investment in the people on your team um, is just so, so evident, um, which I love. It's like all these processes, all the ideas can only be executed when you trust the people on your team and you can keep handing that stuff over to them. So I, I, I love, love that. Um, so yeah, so we're going to dive into kind of a practical question here for you all um, is just, this is like, this is cross gamut of industry. And knowing that we're kind of roofing, siding windows, bath, gutters, all that kind of stuff is, um, it's going to cross the gamut here a little bit, but I wanted to project to you guys, what should companies be expecting to invest? So like gross marketing percentage companies should be expecting to invest to scale. So one of the questions we get often is going the all in marketing cost, that gross marketing cost, how much should we be and ready to invest there? Some companies like they want to scale, but they're not willing to put the money in, but what are you seeing companies at scale investing? Um, to to get to scale and um, and and why? Let's go through that. So Nathan, you're you're the first one up here. You're last. Oh person. man, oh, your first this one. This question. It, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, it's every time, right? Every time. How much money should I be investing in my marketing? Chris is over here, like yes. So um, <laughs> honestly, it really just it really just depends. Uh, 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 I know uh, nobody wants to hear that. Here's the thing. I've seen companies invest dollar wise, invest very little in their marketing because they were very grassroots and boots on the ground. They were looking to, they were looking to, you know, petition initiative, essentially their marketing system. And it was a lot of that direct marketing. It was a lot of that community involvement and you're not going to hear their ad on a, on a, on a, on the radio station. you may not see their ad in a, in a newspaper People are still reading those and they are, by the way. Um, and so the marketing cost dollar wise for that is actually fairly low, uh, but it is a very time intensive action. Here, here's my thing about the time intensive action. If you don't have any leads, what the hell else are you doing? So are we just sitting around like, okay, so this is a free thing that just costs us time. And if we're not running leads, then let's just go do this. So and the other thing that happens too is that expectation of that. That direct marketing will will definitely take time, and in a lot of ways, you might hear more no's than you expected per se. Uh, but once again, what else are you doing? Number one, and number two, the results of that will probably be fairly quick. Okay, and even if you consider some of the more, I like to call it, you guys are familiar, guerrilla marketing right? Creative methodologies, uh, getting out, doing neighborhood block parties, doing a town hall event in a particular area, um, you know, hosting charity events, all these different kinds of things that at the end of the day, probably don't have a huge cost associated with them, but they are time involved and direct. And so that cost could be all over the map. Now, when you start breaking into this concept of of doing more top of mind marketing and you start getting into social media marketing, I, I, I've seen... I've seen guys spend, you know, when they're looking for a top of mind marketing, 10% of their total revenue or more. They're buying, they're buying radio ads. They're doing some TV commercials. They're putting up billboards. They're doing print market. They're doing mass mailers, which are mass mailers seem so simple, wildly expensive. And if you see a turn 2% turnover rate on that, you're killing it. Okay. Are they effective? Yes. Once again, that expectation becomes important because especially with top of mind marketing, it's a big spend and it takes a long time. So you got to buckle up, Buttercup, if that's going to be your plan. It's going to take a long time. And then and then what happens too is those you start to see that return. And if you happen to be in a storm or, or weather event driven market, that turn can come in a tidal wave when that happens. And so you got to be prepared for that. Um, 
So your market spend is going to vary all over the map from 10% of your total revenue to very little, but more time-based. I know that's not a super specific answer, but I'll leave some more specific answers for, uh, for uh, Chris, Pete, and Doug. Yeah, Chris, I'll turn it over to you. I'm curious what, uh, uh, what you're seeing at companies that are doing kind of all in marketing cost at scale. I mean, again, I, I do come from that non-traditional mindset. That's pretty much canvas, events, retail, brand ambassador. Um, and, and, and after I tell you my quick little story, I will give you actually a number. I'll, I'll put a number on what we look for and stuff. But the first thing I, I, I will tell you that people that have been in an industry for a long time will tell you that a good department or events department will give you a low cost per lead issued. It's a, it's a, as far as what you're spending on the lead, it, it should be pretty good. But I say that knowing that I get hired by companies at times that are, that are struggling, you know, it, with their canvas or, or events department. And, and if you don't manage those departments carefully, the cost can run out of control. 20%, 30%. Um, and there's a lot of costs you don't think about, like a, a van a van breaks down. Uh, are you going to buy them water in the summer when it's hot? Are you going to get a little hand warmers when it's cold? Are you going to supply them winter jackets if you're in Minnesota? You know, on and on and on. There's a lot of costs that you might not expect. Um, but what I what I can tell you is, we strive for a, a 10% cost of marketing, like say in a, in a canvas department, right? The better canvas departments are at 10% or, or, or less. Um, in the beginning, there's going to be some layout. Like I, I have some owners that have three vans before they had a team, before they had a manager. They, they're like, hey, I have three vans in the parking lot, you know. So there, there is going to be some uh, upfront cost. One of the things we find with the brand ambassadors is the cost tends to be lower because there's usually just one or two of them for someone that wants to start out not spending a, a lot of money to start a, a program that might generate leads and whatnot. But, but in general, it's funny because uh, Nathan mentioned 10%. That's kind of like, that would be my happy place for a canvas department. Like if we spend $20,000 this month, let's make at least 200,000. Yeah. You know, we want it. We want that kind of return. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, Pete, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. So I'd say generally speaking, the rule of thumb for our industry is that 10% number. We hear it almost every day when we are in our meetings. And that 10%, that is coming from gross revenue. So if your gross revenue is a million, then you are you should invest 100000 in marketing. And again, that, that's going to vary depending on your services, how long you've been in business, the market you service. There are certainly variables, but just kind of generally speaking, that is what we hear almost almost always is that 10%. So it's in line with what it sounds like Nathan and Chris are mentioning. Um, you know, so uh, if you're looking to scale and really ramp that up, I think there are certainly things that we need to consider. Certainly the profit, you know, where you're at, can you afford to do so? Again, are you introducing a new service? Um, if so, you know, what is it? You know, baths, um, uh, bath companies, generally invest a little bit more than 10%. They're closer to 12%. But um, yeah, that's what we hear. Uh, I don't know. We're probably between all the guys on our business development team, we're, we're talking to, I don't know, a few dozen contractors in like a strategy session, you know, every week. And this, this number comes up on almost every call and 10% is almost always the number. Yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah, Doug, what do you what do you have for us? This is this is a tough one to go last on, guys. I mean, I gotta t <laughs> I gotta tell you, okay. This is a this is a tough one. Drum roll. Yes, okay. 10% has been a general standard in the industry for a long time. I think a few things I would add to everybody's really insightful comments that we've already heard. You know, Nathan made a really good point earlier that a lot of companies spend less from a actual media perspective, but then it's people cost. And it's really hard when you think about people cost and how you divide their time to put that on a balance sheet and associate it with your marketing 
but that is how you kind of have to think about it if if they're doing that for you right um the other thing i would add and agree with pete uh big time on is how profitable you are and how that factors into your spend, right? The, the more profitable you are, the more you should be investing in your marketing, the more dialed in your metrics are, right? When you really know that cost really, that cost per acquisition and, and you're profiting well, you should be investing more in your marketing. If you're dipping below 8%, that's dangerous territory. 10% um, is really optimal for success, but you know we say at a minimum that eight and 10% and, and upwards of 12 or 15, is a good place to go when you have the infrastructure to make that possible. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think the 10% number, just as you guys said here is that what we hear often too, is that 10% is typically where everyone tries to stay up from an all in marketing cost. And, and there's certain sources just to, you know, plug you guys over Doug over there too, like Google AdWords, you're going to be really hard pressed to get a 10% marketing cost out of a Google search ad campaign, or even sometimes social campaigns as well. So there are going to be campaigns that uh, if you're at scale and depending on your product, you could be pushing 15 to 20% all in marketing costs every day of the week. It You can't do that if you are not set up from a profitability to absorb that type of marketing cost. The companies who are at scale within this industry have it slotted to spend 20% on marketing 15% on marketing to be able to hit the numbers and to stay at the scale that they are. Um, but what brings that number down, you, you're you going to have higher cost sources, you're going to have lower cost sources like canvassing and events are typically on that lower that help even things out on that side of things. But you got to look at all of your marketing costs from an all in perspective, just as you said, Doug, with like that's people and the resources and the cost of the ads and the cost of the media and all that kind of stuff put in there as well. So, um, you know, Gavin, just to dive into some of the Q&A here, Gavin, you mentioned mature markets versus a new market will likely double those marketing costs. Um, so I, I think that's an absolute fantastic observation there, too, is that you're brand new to a market. It's going to cost you more to market into that area. You have less referrals. You have less return and rehash business to get in that uh, that as well. Um, so hopefully that long term, if you're actually treating a lead like a long term customer journey and you're able to help them consistently, you're able to get more out of that lead and hopefully over time decrease your marketing cost in that market. So awesome. Well, I want to say thank you to everybody who like these answers to these questions are like, I'm uh, just amazing. I think like, you know, going through a panel like discussion like this is is so fun to see how you guys the the confirmation on this stuff is so huge versus just one of you guys being on a call. And I appreciate all your individual perspectives on the stuff here too. Um, I wanted to address. We have uh, time for a few questions here. Uh, Annie, you had asked this question, um, and I'll, I'll present this uh, over to Pete here. I think he'd be a great one to answer this one here for us uh, to start with. But what's the best way to generate referral business um, and uh, and like a couple strategies there for us? Well, first of all, you need to provide that great experience up front, right? I mean, if, if we're not doing that, it's going to be difficult to get the referral. That probably goes without saying, but... Most of what we see when we kind of go through these exercises is, you know, we try to, you know, a lot of contractors will try to introduce a referral program at the end of maybe the sale. And then once again, at the end of the job, right, once the job's been completed, and then it's kind of just forgotten about, there's not a lot of follow up. And I think there's this belief that referrals really only come at a couple different times during the um, you know, the, um, I guess the, 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 the cycle that you're in the home with the, with the home, with the homeowner. And it's really not the case. Referrals can come months later, years later. And a lot of it's just being in touch and consistently showing up and reminding, you know, um, your customers what it is that you're doing for referrals. Um, again, that you reward for referrals. And, and actually there are, a lot of different strategies. Some of the ones that we found to be the most successful are, you know, someone will implement some type of a quarterly contest where basically it's just an excuse to show up and remind your customers about your referral program. 
And then they integrate that contest into all of their long-term communication. So when they're, you know, reaching back out and maybe trying to, you know, do that top of mind awareness marketing, they're, they're referencing the referral program. Um, I would say, however you want to tackle it, just always keep in mind that referrals are a long-term play. It's a, it's not just something that's you're in and out with. You want to stay top of mind and remind people again, I think there was a, a stat like 83% of homeowners are willing to relieve a referral, but only 17% do. And that's either because we didn't leave a good enough story for them to tell. We didn't ask for the referral, which in some cases just is, you know, um, the issue, or we just uh, didn't remind them of the referral program and stay in touch and just keep you know, driving the, um, the referral. The other thing I would say is when you do put together a reward for the referral, don't make them jump through a bunch of hoops to get it. You know, there's all kinds of things we hear like, Oh, you got to, to qualify for the payout. This has to happen. Or if this happens six times, we're going to give you this much more money and it gets really confusing and people check out. So one of the things that we suggest is reward the appointment. Um, if they don't buy uh, you know, again, you have to run the appointment. It has to be qualified. Keep your standards in place. But if, if for some reason that that re referral does not buy, it's not necessarily their job, the referee's job to close it. It's your job. As long as they're getting you in front of the appointment and you run it and you quote price, we suggest paying out some type of a, um, you know, $20, 25 bucks for the appointment. And by doing that versus paying the condition, the win, we see six times more referrals come through versus uh, the uh, the alternative. Yeah. So hopefully those are some tips. We we oh, certainly can tell you and share other ideas, but uh, definitely uh, ask for them and then stay in touch and continue to ask for them. Yeah, and um, after the call here too, that was another person on the uh, answer to your question here for you. G four is the answer to your question. <laughs> um, reaching out to them, that's why they're on this call here, Pete and the, uh, their team over there. Are amazing at kind of putting these referral programs together for, for companies. Um, and I, I want to wrap up and respect our speaker's time here. I just wanted to, to honor you guys. You guys have all spent your hard-earned time and energy and effort showing up here, being seen and answering questions so that other people can move their businesses forward and sharing your advice and your, your skills. I so, so appreciate your time today um, and taking that here for us. So, um, and, and I would ask of everyone who's on the call here, show your appreciation for them, reach out to these companies, um, give them a high five, reach out to them on social media here as well. Um, and again, um, Pete, Chris, Nathan, Doug, I, so, so thank you for your time today and Kate for, for co-hosting with me today. Thank you everyone for your time today. Um, and have an amazing rest of the week. We'll thank see y'all later. Thanks. Everybody. Thanks Sean. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Bye guys.